All right. Um, so uh, I'm Ben Dickinson. I'm the Lake Michigan fisheries biologist for Indiana DNR. Uh, bear with me while I, whoops, do I do a space bar here? Or? Just click. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to speed up through a couple of uh, not not as relevant stuff to get to the meat of the talk. So uh, I've been with the, the Lake Michigan program for a decade. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do at our office uh, is cooperative work. We work with a lot of statewide partners. Um, we do annual sampling for yellow perch and lake trout. Um, the, the lake trout stuff was was referenced in the earlier talk, the lake wide assessment stuff. Um, we do a lot of outreach like this, and uh, we do an annual creel survey on the streams and the lakefront. If you guys have been out fishing, you've probably encountered our, our creel clerks before. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the mass marking project that was talked about with those coated wire tags um, and some Indiana specific results. Uh, give a, a update on some yellow perch uh, from a recreational fishery perspective. Uh, and then talk about a little bit about the predator prey balance in the lake and uh, how that relates to some of the trends we're seeing in our angler survey data and the recreational fishery for trout and salmon. Um, so I don't know if we can, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be brief about this because we already talked about it a little bit in, in one of the previous talks, but uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is marking every single lake trout uh, in every single steelhead <coughs> and tagging them uh, that goes into the lake right now. Uh, and they're clipping Chinook salmon and they make some wonderful maps like you see on here on the right, which is the percent wild Chinook salmon uh, for, I'm not sure what year that was that I borrowed that slide for, but uh, lots of very amazing data are coming out of this project. Uh, and right now we're really looking at steelhead, uh, which are a big deal in Indiana because we stock quite a lot of steelhead. <laughs> So uh, coated wire tags are super, super tiny. Uh, you can see on the left, that's my finger there with the little a little, little microscopic tag there. Um, and they have a six digit code that's uh, laser etched on there. Um, and that's the same tag blown up 35 times. Uh, and you can see it starting on the right side there, it says 641 uh, and then 090. And I've stared at a bunch of those. So I know that that means that that was a Trail Creek stock Mania steelhead. Uh, so we can tell where the fish was stocked, who stocked it, what strain it was, um, you know, the size that it was stocked at. So we can really get a lot of really good data from this program. It wouldn't be possible without a, a lot of cooperation and a lot of agencies pitching into this. Um, so the pandemic kind of threw, threw a little loop in this plan uh, in 2020, the uh, the fish, uh, everything except lake trout, uh, we did not get those tagged. The, the pandemic lockdowns prohibited travel. So um, unfortunately, uh, the, the two-year-old fish out there right now, the Chinooks and, and Steelhead, uh, they're not clipped or tagged. Um, I borrowed this slide from the Great Lakes Mass Marking Project up in Green Bay. Uh, this was some of the earliest data um, on survival, relative survival of steelhead. So these are fish caught in the open lake by boaters uh, and, and biotechs uh, take the tags from these fish and, and look at where they were stocked. And early returns were the Indiana steelhead um, on the left here that the, the box spot, the, the black horizontal line there, that's kind of the, the mean relative survival. And you can see the Indiana is, is higher than Wisconsin and Michigan considerably. Um, Probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one, this is pretty preliminary data and uh, uh, things tend to kind of even out over time. But uh, Skimania steelhead are larger at stocking size than a lot of other state steelhead because Skimania steelhead, we spawn those in January and February, whereas uh, the winter run strains get spawned a little later. So the Skimania have a couple of extra months in the hatchery and get bigger. So uh, they're probably at the early outset of the mass marking project, they're bigger, which means they're more likely to be caught by anglers in their first and second year. Uh, just a hypothesis. Uh, and then it's possible that Skimania are more, you know, susceptible to the boat trollers um, than, say, a winter run or a Chambers Creek strain steelhead or something like that. Uh, but we in Indiana were extremely happy to see that our steelhead are performing well. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> Some other preliminary results from the mass marketing project show that about 40% uh, on average over the first three year classes they looked at were wild steelhead, um, which is not quite as high as, as the uh, Chinook salmon, but still a pretty considerable chunk uh, of wild steelhead. And that dovetailed real nicely with the otolith microchemistry project that was going on in the same time frame. Um, so showed about 40% wild steelhead on average. So uh, important to note, for Indiana and Illinois, uh, almost none of that 40% is coming from the south end of the lake just because we don't have suitable habitat for reproduction. Most of that is probably Michigan, Pierre Marquette, Little Manistee, um, those really nice blue ribbon trout stream type waters. Uh, another thing, Scamania steelhead, that's the only brood stock that Indiana controls ourselves. So we get coho salmon and, and Chinook salmon eggs from other states, primarily Michigan. Uh, but we take Scamania strain steelhead eggs ourselves uh, from Trail Creek. And uh, we took a bunch of tags out of our brood stocks fish to confirm that they were, in fact, Scamania strain. We really didn't want to be cross contaminating, uh, you know, winter run steelhead and summer run steelhead. Uh, so thankfully, uh, we, we thought we were doing a pretty good job and the tags confirmed it. They were all Scamania steelhead. Hatchery guys could breathe a sigh of relief. Um, interestingly enough, so we're taking these from Trail Creek itself and uh, only 85%, well, I say only, it's pretty, pretty high percent, but 85% of the fish were Trail Creek fish. 15% of them were strays from the nearby Little Calumet and Salt Creek stocking. So pretty close, you know, they're, they're you know, 15 miles apart, but uh, there, there was some significant straying from the, the nearby stocking. Uh, other note on there, um, last year, I don't have this year's data yet because we haven't spawned them yet, but uh, last year uh, about three quarters of the fish were three-year-olds and uh, a quarter of them were four-year-olds. So uh, most of the Scamania appear to be running at age three compared to age four. Um, and if you had run into our creel clerks on the lakefront or the stream this year, you might have been asked uh, to donate your head uh, of a steelhead. Uh, we are trying to get as many heads as possible while they're still tagged, because um, only one or two more years of the tagging program for steelhead before it rotates uh, to other species. And uh, we're really trying to get those heads. So um, we got quite a few heads this year from our creel clerks, and uh, we saw we have a freezer. Uh, we got a little late in the year, but we got a freezer at Marina Shores in Portage and one at Washington Park in Michigan City. Uh, and we got about 100 heads that anglers donated to those freezers. Uh, so look for those next summer. We're going to get them out right away, um, hopefully at East Chicago Marina as well. Uh, there's a nice little data sheet in there that you can fill out and donate your head to us. Um, and if you leave your contact information, we'll even email you the tag info. Um, so mo most of the fish that we got from Creel this summer were from uh, boat and pier guys uh, in July, uh, June and July. Not surprisingly, most of those came back as, as Scamania strain steelhead. So no, no big surprises there. Um, oh yeah, and I bolded that to remind myself, we really need heads from the Little Calumet in Salt Creek, especially in the wintertime. Uh, less angler effort over there, and we don't have the broodstock uh, collection to kind of inform us over there. So uh, if you or friends are fishing on the Little Cal or Salt Creek, uh, save your heads and, and turn them into us. City? Yep, yeah, at Michigan City. Um, is, that, is there still a uh, Marina Shores? It's not now. Uh, they shut the water off and the power and stuff, so uh, we, we pulled it in. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get it back out uh, when they turn it back on in April-ish. Uh, question was, was if the freezers were still out for the, the online people. Uh, shifting gears here to, to Yellow Perch, uh, some of it was mentioned already in the Drown River Mouth uh, talk, uh, but you know the, the fishing, the Yellow Perch population has, has really fallen off, uh, especially compared to the 80s and 90s. Um, we've seen pretty poor recruitment, which is uh, the term biologists use to describe spawning success, um, patchy, patchy fishing success. Um, you know, something that some anglers have talked about and I've noticed is that 
we don't have long stretches of really nice conditions anymore in the summer. You know, we don't have a, a consistent thermocline. We get more frequent north winds, it seems like. Um, the, the fish are more scattered. Um, they might be moving deeper. You know, we pick perch up out to 80 to 90, 100 feet in our lake trout assessments. Um, and that's no fun to, to fish in 90 feet of water for perch. So um, it, it seems to be shifting offshore a little bit, maybe. Um, so I'm going to show some some creel data here. Um, the the actual numbers are are less important than the trend lines. So our our orange line here is is angler effort from our creel survey, and then the blue line is catch rate. So uh, you can see that that they're they're both kind of variable. And in the left part of that graph, which is 2000 to 2010, they they kind of trend together. Makes sense, you know. Fishing is really good. More people go fishing, they catch more fish. Um, but then they kind of diverge in 2010 and catch rate kind of stayed. I mean, it declined some, but it, but, you know, not nearly as much as the effort there, which is, which is pretty interesting, I think. Um, I, I have some, some theories, but that's really all they are. Um, I think a big part of it is that there, the effort is way lower. I think a lot of the um, kind of fair weather perch anglers, I mean, I think uh, somebody mentioned it earlier that it doesn't take a hundred thousand dollar boat to go out perch fishing. Any anybody can go out there with a, a hook and a sinker and some minnows and catch fish. And uh, you don't have to be a, an amazing angler. And I think that a lot of the maybe less experienced and, and less skilled anglers have dropped out of the fishery, and only kind of the diehard perch anglers remain. So I think they're kind of artificially inflating the catch rate back to you know compared to what it was thirty years ago. Um, and then also something that's very interesting is, I don't know if you can see this, but this is June. So uh, June catch rate and effort are extremely correlated. And that's typically when perch fishing kicks off for the summer. And I think what's happened is that June fishery has gone away. Uh, we still see pretty decent catch rates in July, August, even, even into September and October now. Uh, but I think that people, go out and get discouraged in June or they don't hear anything good. And then they, they just decide not to perch fish later in the year, maybe. Um, e even though sometimes into September, we have great perch fishing. It's just not as many people participate. Come on. Um, and then I mentioned recruitment success. So this, this graph here is, um, the number of juvenile perch caught per hour of trawling. Uh, Ball State used to do this, and now we do it now. Um, but, you know, left side of the graph here is in the early 80s. You can see there was pretty consistent recruitment. And then in the mid-90s, there was a period of, of bad spawns. Um, and then in, in the late 90s to early 2000s, we started getting some somewhat consistent spawning success. And then basically from, say, 2008, forward with the exception of the amazingly just out of the blue amazing 2015 spawn we have had almost nothing uh, compared to what we used to so um, that's likely a result of massive ecosystem changes from quagga mussels um, but we, we just don't see the re recruitment success that we used to uh, shifting gears a little bit again uh, back to trout and salmon. So uh, this is the predator prey ratio. Um, and the reason I put this up there is to talk about kind of the, the predator prey balance in the lake. This is what the, the lake committee uses to kind of set uh, stocking policy um, at, a, at a large level. And it's three, three lines here. The top one is the estimated Chinook salmon biomass in the lake. The middle one is the estimated alewife, which is the primary prey of Chinook salmon. And then the third one is just the Chinook biomass on the top divided by the alewife biomass. So we're basically looking to see how well they're balanced um, with this bottom graph. And then the red line, the red uh, zone there is the danger zone. Basically, that if, if that trend line gets up into that danger zone, that means we have not enough alewife to support the Chinook salmon population. Uh, if it's in the green zone, that says, you know, hey, maybe this is more alewife uh, heavy compared to um, less alewife heavy. So as you can see, the trend line there back in the 90s, it was there was a lot more alewife, a um, lot fewer Chinooks. Um, that really increased in the 2000s. 
Um, lots of Chinooks, uh, they tend to be on the smaller side. Alewife biomass was declining during that time. Uh, and then really things changed pretty substantially in the predator-prey ratio. Um, they're starting about 20, I don't know, 14, 15. Um, there were some big salmon stocking cuts because of significant concern about the alewife biomass. Um, and then you can see in the, it bottomed out that middle graph uh, just past 2015, it almost bottomed out. We almost, the lake almost crashed. Uh, and then as a result of those significant salmon cuts, uh, we've started to build back alewife biomass to some degree. Um, and then the, the most recent value was uh, 2021 there, you know, we're in that green zone. Um, so, so we're feeling a lot better about where the lake is today than it was five years ago. Um, I said most of this just now, but you know, we're, we're cautiously optimistic. Um, yesterday, we officially announced in Indiana a modest Chinook stocking increase, uh, 50,000 fish, uh, which is about an 8% increase to our total Chinook salmon equivalent. So it's, it's certainly nothing major, uh, but, but it is an increase. That's pretty big news because, you know, there's, you know going back 10 years, um, there were pretty substantial cuts. So uh, we feel pretty good about where we're at now, although, you know, it's inherently an un unstable system with alewife uh, being a boomer bus spawner. So, you know, obviously we keep monitoring this and updating that predator prey ratio every year, um, but, but pretty big news for the Chinook salmon uh, increase. And go through this pretty fast since I think we're getting short on time here, uh, but I'm gonna show you some creel data. Uh, from trout and salmon. Um, this is catch rate. Uh, I think the scale's cut off here on the left, but the trends are what's important. The blue line on top here is coho salmon. This is the boat fishery in Indiana. Uh, so you can see it's very dominated by coho salmon. Not a surprise uh, to most people who, who know our fishery. Um, and then the green is lake trout. So the lake trout have been ascending. Um, those are the two main stories that coho remained pretty strong and lake trout have been ascending in Indiana in the boat fishery. Um, and then this is kind of what I want to talk about a little bit since we just talked about Chinook stocking increase. Um, so this graph is the estimated number of Chinooks caught in our stream fishery. And uh, you can see on the left, it goes back to 2002, um, very, really variable. Um, and that's from alewife year class strength and um, just kind of the nature of a, a salmon run, right? If it's a cold, wet year, maybe it's a better run than a hot, dry year, that sort of thing. Um, but you can see in 2014 and 15, it, it pretty much drops off a cliff and stays there. And uh, that was immediately following a big lake-wide Chinook cut. So we heard from our anglers a lot, hey, you know, uh, the salmon cut is ruined Indiana fishing, you know, you, you need to stock more fish. Well, the thing is, is that Indiana doesn't really have any wild reproduction and we didn't cut salmon stocking until 2017 where that little black arrow is there. Uh, and Chinooks spend at least two years out in Lake Michigan before they return in the fall. So the red arrow there in 2019 is when we would have expected to see the result of our Chinook cut in Indiana. So it crashed probably five years before we would have expected to see a result of that. And that's purely a form, uh, you know, the reflection of poor survival on the lake. The alewife population was way down. Um, survival, Chinooks need alewife to survive. Uh, they just weren't getting enough food to, to make it back to adulthood in Indiana. Um, and then we can see that this is mass marking data that I, that I pulled out. And this is, um, it only goes to the 2016 year class because that's when we switched the tags over to steelhead. Uh, but you can see starting in the 2011 year class survival, this is a trend of survival based on lake-wide recoveries of our fish. On the left there in 2011, very high survival, pretty linear trend down in the 2016 year class, extremely you know, fast decline in survival. Um, but kind of, kind of, uh, some good news. <clears throat> this is the catch rate of our, our stream fishery. I'm using rate because the fishing effort varies considerably. So, you know, a hundred thousand angler hours versus 20,000 angler hours, you know, that changes a lot, but catch rate is kind of more important to us because that's what we think of as fishing success. You know, how many fish you're catching per hour. 
Um, and as you can see, catch rate, this goes back to 2007, catch rate from like 07 to 13 was, was pretty high. And then it, and it uh, dipped down substantially with the exception of 2017. Uh, and then started trending back up after 2020. And I, I just pulled this data like three days ago uh, from our creel. So it's a little preliminary, but 2022, our stream fishery catch rate was the best that we've seen since 2007, uh, which was surprising to me. But there were more Chinooks in our streams. Uh, I saw more Chinooks in one day this year on Trail Creek than I had in like the five years combined before that. So a uh, really strong run of Chinooks this year, which was awesome to see. Uh, and this is that same data, but I've also adjusted it for the number stocked because the number of stocked salmon have, has gone up and down. So um, we started stocking, our cut got down to 75,000 fish annually um, a few years ago. And then starting in 2020, we were, we're back to our normal pre-cut level of 225,000. Um, so once you adjust for those numbers, uh, the green circle there last few years, uh, we've seen really good catch rates, um, you know, more returns than we would even expect. So that means that survival is going up of our fish rather than down. So that's an extremely encouraging sign. Uh, and, and I would I would anticipate really next year, uh, if this trend holds, that we'll have a, a stupendous fall return. So it feels really good to say that. Uh, I've, it's been doom and gloom in all these meetings for a decade about. So hopefully I'm not wrong. Uh, and then this is uh, similar. This is the boat fishery for salmon. Uh, the blue line is, is Chinooks and the orange line is Coho. Uh, you can see that same trend tracking just like the, the uh, year class strength. Um, this is fall near shore boat salmon fishing in Indiana. So uh, declining survival, declining catches. 21 and 22, uh, it, it's starting to get back up to kind of where it was uh, pre-stocking cuts. Um, and then since I was talking about steelhead earlier, uh, I've been talking about kind of the catch rate per, uh, per fish stocked. Um, and, and the blue line is the Chinooks. That was all the data I was just showing you. The green line is steelhead. So uh, in general, steelhead in Indiana, uh, between five and 10 times better return rate per fish stocked in general, um, which isn't too surprising because our yearling steelhead are like seven and a half to eight inches long when they go in. Uh, a Chinook is four inches. Um, just a bigger fish, they have a more flexible diet. They have uh, a lot of advantages. Um, they're also, I think, easier to catch in the stream. They're still feeding in the stream. Um, so uh, just in terms of the, the stream fishery, uh, steelhead are, are a lot, you know, more uh, of a return. Uh, the flip side of that is in our hatchery, you can only, in the space that you can make 15,000 yearling steelhead, you can do 75,000 Chinooks. So it's, it's not, a, you know, it's not a direct one-to-one -one trade off. Um, so we, we do like to have a diverse fishery by, by stocking a, a bunch of different uh, fish. Um, so I zipped through that pretty quick, but if anybody has questions, I'd be more than happy to go, go back or, Answer anything if we got time here. Yeah, we have, we have time. Um, I think technically we're done at eight thirty. I think I just went into that for a couple. Um, I'm going to hand out some paper surveys for all of the common web people who did it, um, and just go ahead and ask questions. I can see that. Um, so are you still clicking out of those things on Teams right now? Yeah, yeah. For the online people, you asked if the the kings were still clipped adipose, and yes, they they are, uh, with the exception of the 2020 year class uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, but all stocked kings except those are are clipped. They just don't have the tags. Um, so if if you catch, there'll be three year olds next year. So it, you know if you're catching large three year old fish, they could be wild. They could be stocked. We just don't really know. But but the young ones, the smaller ones, they'll they'll be clipped. Yeah, correct. The 2020, both of Steelhead and Chinooks didn't get clipped or tagged. Do you have any online questions? When you stock things in the what are you stocking? 
uh, question was, uh, where are we stocking Kings in Indiana? Um, right now we're stocking, uh, we're splitting equally among East Chicago Marina, Little Calumet River and Trail Creek. Sure, yeah. And on the, on the really on the side, where the place that's for storage or on the shelf, is that a that comes with the Oh, yeah. Oh, you can't say that. Oh, Sorry. I was like, uh, wait. The, the question online was uh, the whitefish foraging at Gumby Reef, and the answer was yes. And which piece were it school at Crescent? Uh, uh, drum Wilmette Reef. Wilmette, the, the drum was on Wilmette Reef. Those were nice drum. They looked pretty big. It was, they were all that size. Yeah, I know, I know you like drum now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't surprised, you know, to, to see that uh, offshore because, you know, I've caught them in 70 feet of water before gotcha. salmon fishing. And well, I mean, that was a little bit of a surprise, but yeah, yeah, yeah. not unheard of. They seem to be thicker when it warms up closer to shore. The drum, yeah, yeah. July, yep. I think they follow the alewife in when the alewife come into spawn, and they kind of like June, July. Yeah. 